First Kings chapter 20, verse 1 and following, and I'm going to read from the New King James. Now Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, gathered all his forces together, 32 kings with him, with horses and chariots, and he went up and he besieged Samaria and made war against it. And then he sent messengers into the city of Ahab, king of Israel, and said to him, Thus says Ben-Hadad, Your silver and your gold are mine. Your loveliest wives and children are mine. And the king of Israel answered and said, My lord, O king, just as you say, I and all that I have are yours. Then the messengers came back and said, Thus speaks Ben-Hadad, saying, Indeed, I have sent to you, saying, You shall deliver to me your silver and your gold and your wives and your children. But I will send my servants to you tomorrow about this time, and they shall search your house and the houses of your servants, and it shall be that whatever is pleasant in your eyes will put in their hands, and they will take it. So the king of Israel called all the elders of the land and said, Notice, please, and see how this man seeks trouble. For he sent to me for my wives and my children, my silver and my gold, and I did not deny him. And the elders of all the people said to him, Do not listen or consent. Therefore, he said to the messengers of Ben-Hadad, Tell my lord the king, All that you sent for to your servant the first time I will do. But this thing I cannot do. And the messengers departed and brought back word to him. Then Ben-Hadad sent to him and said, The gods do to me and more so, if enough dust is left in Samaria for a handful for each of the people who follow me. So the king of Israel answered and said, Tell him, let not the one who puts on his armor boast like he's the one who takes it off. And it happened when Ben-Hadad heard this message, as he and the kings were drinking at the command post, that he said to his servants, get ready, and they got ready to attack the city. Verse 13, suddenly a prophet approached Ahab, king of Israel, saying, thus saith the Lord, have you seen all the great multitude? Behold, I will deliver it into your hand today, and you shall know that I am the Lord, that is, I am Jehovah. So Ahab said, By whom? And he said, Thus says the Lord, By the young leaders of the provinces. And then he said, well, Who will set the battle in order? And he answered, You. Then he mustered the young leaders of the provinces, and there were 232 and after them he mustered all the people and the children of Israel, 7,000. So they went out at noon, and meanwhile Ben-Hadad and 32 kings helping him were getting drunk at the command post. And the young leaders in the province went out first, and Ben-Hadad sent on the patrol, and they told him, saying, Men are coming out of Samaria. And he said, If they have come out in peace, then take them alive. And they've come out in war, take them alive. Then the young leaders of the provinces went out of the city with the army which followed them. And each one killed his man, so the Syrians fled. And Israel pursued them. And Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, escaped on a horse with his cavalry. Verse 21. Then the king of Israel went out and attacked the horses and the chariots and killed the Syrians with a great slaughter. King Ahab is about to be attacked by the Syrians. They believed that they were going to just wipe Israel off of the face of the earth. But when you read verse 20 and 21, you find that God ultimately is going to give them the victory. But there is a lot that we can learn in this story, not just about people's ways and things that they do in their life, but also the way the enemy attacks and his strategy in the earth. You see, God did not speak to Ahab. He did not give him this word. He did not give him this victory on his own merits. He did it out of his love. And oftentimes, saints, even if people are living in sin, God will still, out of his love and out of his kindness, he will still bless them. He will still try to give them the victory. The Bible tells us that it is the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. And this is what God was doing. 
He was showing Ahab and the children of Israel who had turned their back on God, his goodness. They were about to be wiped out, but God sent a word to them. You see, God had a covenant with Israel and he was seeking to get the people to get their attention once again and to get them to turn around. And he did this by giving them a great victory. You see, miracles are frequently misunderstood. Sometimes people think, well, it's because the person that's laying hands or some great person of God. Well, that may or may not be the case. It could just simply be that God's wanting to bless in that moment. The prophet themselves may think, oh, God's using me mightily, so he must approve of my life. But this is not necessarily true because God will use people irregardless of how they may be living. Now, we certainly should live right, and I'm 100% for that. I'm for living in a life of holiness and all of that. But we mustn't mistake the fact that God is using a person, that that means he's signing off on them and everything they're doing. The Bible tells us in the Old Testament, you know the story, that God even used the mouth of a mule or a donkey to speak to a prophet. And he spoke with a man's mouth to them. And if God can use a mule, he can use just about anyone. So we mustn't put confidence in ourselves. God is often doing things out of his mercy. The recipients of the miracle may think that it proved that God approved of their ways, thought it approved of their lifestyle, but God makes it to rain on the just and the unjust alike. And this is what the scripture teaches. You see, God wasn't authenticating the prophet and he wasn't condoning the people's sin. You say, why would God bless them this way? Because he wanted to be good to them. Why did he use the prophet? Because he wanted a mouthpiece to be good to the people and to speak to them. He performed this miracle primarily to show his goodness and to show that there was a God in Israel. And God does this oftentimes. He is very intentional about the things that he does. You see, miracles and revelations that come from God, saints, can either harden us or they can soften us towards the Lord. You see that. They can either harden us or they can soften us. Sometimes one miracle isn't enough to change a person's mind. I think of the widow woman in the life of Elijah that watched the cruise of oil in the bin of flour that never did run dry. You'll remember it. They were having a tremendous famine. But yet they still continued to have food until the thing was over. In other words, until the famine was over. And you would have thought that this would have caused this widow woman's faith to be right up here. I mean, how many of you, if you went in your cupboard and you took out three cans of green beans and you came back the next day and there were still three, I would think that was miraculous. And you did this until the famine was over. Your cupboard never emptied out. You would think, wow, you know, God is powerful. But apparently with this widow woman, she still was kind of vacillating in her faith. You say, what ended up happening? Well, it took the fact that her son died, he died, and the prophet had to go up and lay on top of this child three times till it was resurrected for the woman to finally say, now I know there is a God in Israel. For some people, it might take one miracle. For some people, it may take multiple miracles. But for other people, it doesn't make a difference how many miracles they see they still refuse to believe. There were people in the time of Jesus that watched him turn water into wine. They watched him feed the 5,000. They watched him take just a few loaves and fishes and feed a multitude of 5,000 on one hand. And he did it again. He duplicated the miracle. They saw him walk on water. They saw him steal the storm, cast out devils like legion. They saw him step to the opening of a tomb and just say, Lazarus, come forth. And here comes this man raised from the dead, and yet they still refused to believe. They refused to believe. I remember when the rich man and Lazarus had both died, and the Bible said Lazarus was carried by the angels up into Abraham's bosom. And then here was this rich man who died and was buried. When the rich man was, was in hell and torment, the scripture said, then that he lifted up his eyes and he said, Father Abraham, send Lazarus to touch his finger in water. I'm tormented in this flame. But they went back and forth for a while and finally said, well, if I can't come over there, send somebody back 
to warn my family. And Father Abraham said, no, we can't do that. They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And then he said, oh, no, 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 Father Abraham, if somebody goes back from the dead, surely they will believe. He said, no, they have Moses and the prophets, let them believe them. If he doesn't believe them, neither will they believe if somebody comes back from the dead. Now, saints, if we had somebody's funeral and they were dead three days and they got up out of the casket, you would think that that would wake people up. Did you know, though, that the, that the scribes and the Pharisees, when they saw it, they didn't not only did they not believe, but they sought to kill Lazarus again. Here was a man who was dead. He's now been raised. He was dead three days. They said, oh Lord, don't open, the, don't open the tomb. He stinketh. How many of you know after three days you probably smell bad? Especially if it's hot. Oh, don't open it. Open the thing up. Jesus, Lazarus, come forth. They took off all of his stuff. You would have thought that everyone in Israel would have believed. You would have thought they'd have been lining up to put their faith and trust in Jesus. But this was not the case. You see, some miracles soften people. It gives them faith, but other people, when they turn against it, it only hardens them. And you see this again in the life of Pharaoh. Look at all the miracles that God did, and yet Pharaoh would not believe. He would not turn to the Lord. When Ahab rebelled against the Lord, against Jehovah, and served Baal, he opened himself up, saints, to be plundered by the enemy. He opened himself up. You see, Ben-Hadad demanded in 1 Kings 20, verse 3, look at it again. Your silver and your gold are mine. Your loveliest wives and your children are mine. How many of you know that's the attitude of the devil? Your children are mine. Your family's mine. All your silver and gold, it's all mine. Understand the enemy wants everything, including your life. When he stood against Job, what did he tell God? Yea, skin for skin. All that a man has will he give for his life. And what did he do? He attacked him. God said, you can't take his life. You can afflict him. And he had boils all over his body. You see, the devil wanted to take Job and the devil wants to destroy us as well. And what Ahab should have learned, but unfortunately he did not learn, is that it behooves us to live in such a way that we live under God's hand of protection. I heard a pastor say one time that if you get out from under the hand of God, you don't know what you're capable of. You don't know what you're capable of. You think, oh, I would never do that. That would never happen. Saints, I am mortified and horrified at times when my phone will ring. Saints, listen, the devil will take you farther than you want to go. He will keep you longer than you want to stay. And it behooves you to make sure that you keep yourself under the hand of the Lord. If you give the devil an inch, he will take a mile. My dad used to say that. I give you boys an inch and you take a mile. Well, the devil does it for real, saints. He does it for real. He won't just take a mile. He will take your life. People play around with the devil. They get out from under the hand of God. They don't even know what they're capable of. They don't even know how far the enemy wants to take them. Listen, this is like the devil talking. He's saying to them, your wives are mine. Your children are mine. Your silver and gold is mine. Do you know what's really sad? Ahab said, you're right. It is. Come get it. You can have them. It's unconscionable. I have to read this text four or five times to make sure that I'm not misreading what I'm saying. Here's a man prepared to surrender his whole family to the enemy. His wife, his children, everything to the devil. Therefore he said to the messengers of Ben-Hadad, Tell my lord the king, all that you sent for to your servant the first time I will do. But this next thing you asked for, I cannot do. What did he want? He said, I'm going to send some people into your house and everything that you love, I want. Everything that's pleasant to your eyes, I want. 
That's the devil wanting to completely clean you out. He's wanting to clean out everything you love. Any piece of enjoyment, any kind of joy and satisfaction of life, anything that could bring you happiness. He's like, I'm going to round it up and I'm going to load it up and I'm going to take it. And finally, almost like in a moment of sanity, Ahab says, the first thing I can do, you can have my wives, you can have my gold and silver, my family, but you can't take everything. And they went back. But Ben-Hadad, he was a boaster. He was overconfident. He believed that he could wipe out Samaria and that there would be nothing left. He said, here's how bad I'm going to wipe this out. This is how arrogant this man was. He said, there won't even be enough left of Samaria for each man in my army to have a handful of dust. That's it. That's all that's going to be left. Well, Ahab, he said, let not the person who, or puts on the armor, rather boast as the one who takes it off. As if to say, you don't even really know whether you're going to survive this battle if it takes place. You see, the devil is the ultimate boaster. And oftentimes he will push and he will push and he will push. And there's always the hope that somebody in that moment will come to their senses. I remember a young man that I, I probably told you the story that I work with. He took an overdose of LSD or something really heavy stuff. They're trying to legalize now, believe it or not. But nevertheless, he overdosed to the point to where he told me, he said, Robert, when I opened the car door at the convenience store, hell opened up underneath the car. I couldn't even get out. There was a bottomless pit underneath the car. You would have thought in that moment that would have scared him till he straightened up, but it did not. But saints, listen, it is, there's always the hope that that last thing that the devil does, he's going to push just a little too far and you say, that's it. No more. I've had it. I'm going to repent. I'm going to turn. I'm going to serve God. This is too much. But in this case, this was Ahab's response. It went back and forth. First Kings 20 verse 13. Watch this. Thus saith the Lord. God is getting ready to give him a word. Ahab a word. See that's what happens. Sometimes all that we need to do is just say enough's enough. And then God will speak. And it's just in that moment. He will speak. And he will give you a word of victory. Did you know saints there are a lot of people. That are in bondage this morning. To a lot of things. I don't know if you're familiar with alcoholism. But I grew up in an alcoholic home. From the time I was a little boy till I was 25 years old, my dad was an alcoholic. One day, though, we'd been praying for him and we'd all been given up. He said he put the beer can up to his mouth like this. And he said this. He said there was something in that can. He never said what it was, but I believe it was deliverance. Amen. It was salvation. He set that can down. And you got to understand, I've seen my dad drink two or three six packs of beer at night. Most of my life. Never picked up another can again. So long as he lived as far as I know. And he passed away and knew the Lord. What had to happen? In that moment when that can got to about there. He said you know what this is enough. And that's all it took and deliverance came. This is what happened here. Here's Ahab. I mean this guy he ain't even serving the Lord. But he's showing some just moment of sanity. And God's ready to step in. And give him a word. And he does. Watch this. Thus saith the Lord, have you seen all this great multitude? Behold, I will deliver it unto you and your hand today, and you will know that I am the Lord. I am Jehovah. So Ahab, said, Ahab says to this prophet, by whom? He said, thus saith the Lord, by the young leaders of the province. How many of you know oftentimes that's what God wants to use are the young people? He wants to use the young people. You know what's good about young people? They haven't been through so many bad things that they think everything won't work. They're not cynical. They're not negative. They haven't reached the point where they say, well, I already tried that. There is no use. There's no hope. Oh, no. Young people are, <laughs> as, as Brother Birch used to say, they're willing to charge Hell's Gates with a water pistol. And that's a good thing. Yeah. What did he say? By the young leaders of the provinces. Then he said, who will set the battle in order? 
In other words, who's going to be in charge? Who's going to lead this thing up? You. I bet that was a shock. Saints, listen. It has to begin with you. It has to begin with me. If we want to see victory, if we want to see victory in our home, if we want to see victory in our life, we have to get ready. God will give us a word. God will give us the victory. But we have to be ready to take action when God says take action. When my dad got saved, he set the battle in array in his home. You say, what do you mean? He began to set his house in order. From now on, we go to church. We're going to church Sunday, Sunday night, Sunday, Wednesday. Matter of fact, if there's another service, we'll go to it too. And he put a sticker up on the door in the basement where he had his prayer room. Said, is it Sunday yet? I seen that. I was like, went down there one day. He built an altar. This is, this is a former alcoholic. Just months before, he had a beer can in his hand. Now he's down at this altar with the Bible in hand. This is the radical change. Came by one day. It's like, Dad, why you set that wine cart out there at the street? Why is this happening? You don't even drink wine. You don't like wine. It's like, I know. I know there were some expensive bottles of wine. They were given to me by rich folks. I said, but I can't have it in the house. Why not? Every time I walk by, it gets me thinking about when I was drinking. So it's like, okay, makes sense to me. Good. Came by a couple weeks later, looked out front. There was a whole cart full of old 45s and LPs. Now, I'll have to explain what that is. Maybe. <laughs> If I'd have said CDs, that would have made sense. But these are records. Old records. Guess who was in there? Elvis Presley. <laughs> these records probably had value. I thought, well, why not sell them on eBay? You know what my dad's attitude was? Why would I send something that's going to stumble me? Why would I sell it to someone else? Why would I sell something that's going to stumble them? Stumbling me. I said, well, Dad, well, why you put it out here anyhow? So it got me thinking about when I used to throw parties. I used to have parties in my house and that music, it was all part of it. Gets me thinking about when I used to drink. So I had to get it out of my house. Oh, this is strange to some of you. This is radical Christianity. He got rid of everything out of his life. I said, well, what else are you doing, Dad? I said, well, I'm going a different way home from work. Not even going the same way home. So I used to go down this street here, turn to right, the left, right by the liquor store. He said, I can't go by the liquor store no more. Nope, can't go by no more. Going a different direction now. Didn't even go home. I was like, that's crazy because he probably had to go completely around the block to get home to not go that same way. I said, what else did he do? You'd be in the store with him. We can't go down that aisle. That's the liquor aisle. Can't go down that aisle. Got to go down over here. So you want to go to eat with us tonight, Dad? No, they sell alcohol. Yeah, well, I can't go. Maybe we can go to Cracker Barrel. He'd be mortified if he knew <laughs> what's happened to Cracker Barrel, right? Yeah. He'd be mortified. He'd be turning over in his grave because that was the only place he could go and not have to be confronted with that which kept him bound all those years. You see, Ahab, he asked the question, who's going to do it? Who's going to lead this battle? Who's going to lead the charge? And the prophet just looked at him. You. You. You are the man. You are the woman. You are the person. You take the bull by the horns. You take control of this situation. The man of God came and spoke to the king of Israel and said, Thus saith the Lord. Because the Syrians have said, notice this, they got into this battle. In the first battle they won because it was, it was, a, it was in the hills. It was in the mountains. They won it. The man of God and said, he's, he's reading the enemy's mail. So because the Syrians have said, the Lord is the God of the hills, that is of the mountains, but he is not the God of the valleys. Therefore, I will deliver all this great multitude into your hand and you will know that I am the Lord. You see, what they didn't realize was, is that the God of the mountain is also the God of the valley. Amen. How many of you are with me? I thought somebody would have shouted. The God of the mountain is also the God of the valley. So what did God do? God gave him the victory in the mountain. 
And then he gave him the victory in the valley. Saints, listen, it doesn't make a difference where we are in life. What we're going through, we can still have the victory in our life. We can still have the victory. I want to just read this to you. When you're up on the mountain, life is easy. You've got peace of mind like you've never known. But things change when you're down in the valley. Don't lose faith for you're never alone. You talk of faith when you're on the mountain, but talk comes so easy when life is at its best. Now it's down in the valley of trials and temptation. That's where your faith is really put to the test. For the God of the mountain is still God in the valley. When things grow wrong, He'll make them right. And the God of the good times is still God in the bad times. And the God of the day is still God in the night. Saints, listen to me. You don't have to go back to bondage. You don't have to go back to the thing that keeps stumbling you. You don't have to go back to the thing where the devil's just waiting to say, I want your wife. I want your children. I want your husband. I want your silver and gold. I want your life. You don't have to go back to that bondage. You don't have to go back. Why? Because the God of the mountain is also the God of the valley. He can give you joy in that moment. You say, Brother Robert, you're dead. Did he ever have hard times? Yeah. He had hard times. I can't even tell you some of the bad things that him and my mom went through. He watched my mother go down to the bone with cancer as he took care of her. You say, well, Brother Robert, was it all about the mountain? He was still God in the valley. Did your dad go back to drinking? Nope, not that I know of. He would just reach out to the Lord. All the things that he went through. And saints, that's what we have to do. The devil wants to take everything from you. Everything. He wants to take it away, but God wants to give you the victory. If you're in the cloud, if you're just like, I just can't take anymore. I know the enemy's ready to destroy me. In a moment of sanity, you can just turn and God will give you a word. And you react to that word. He will give you the victory. Again, not just in the mountain, but in the valley. Father, we just thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you that you are the God of the mountain and the God.